All right, so let's just ease into this real nice and slow and get this started. Luke, what is the essence that makes us all human? Go. <laughs> <laughs> How about this one? Faith. Ooh. Touche. Do you consider Morgan a she or an it? It. Why is that? Um, she was, it was always atten- uh, intended to be. Um, though I suppose she comes across as feminine. Yeah. Um, I think that's partly because Anya is in fact a, a woman. <laughs> really? Oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, she's, uh, she was always uh, intended to be um, uh, genderless, androgynous. Do you think that that affected the way that you directed Anya and her character? I mean, and Kate as well, as it turns out. Twist. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it was, you know, uh, trying to get Anya to, um, I mean, we kind of bound you up, didn't we? We tried to make you, we really tortured you, actually, didn't we? We also did yeah. a lot, we, the two of us did a lot of like boxing. Yeah. Because the stunt training That's was crazy. That, yeah. yeah, I mean, there, there was a kind of control that we, uh, Anya and I talked about, about you kind of, uh, we sent you both to dance lessons, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Uh, just to kind of get the whole movement right. And uh, Lee's, Kate's character, Lee was quite a um, tough cookie. Yeah. Yeah. That's being very diplomatic, yes. Total badass is also that was, that was her that. idea. I said, you should come in as really <laughs> sweet and uh, accommodating. But no, no, no. no, no, no. Was I'm not good. sweet or accommodating. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the physical, I think the physical aspect was very important to both of us. Um, and luckily we knew, it was almost two months, I would say, before we started shooting. Um, that we would be making this together and, and so we talked a lot about um, the physical aspects of these characters and how important that is. So we were doing, I was training um, before I went to Ireland with both um, ballet and also boxing so the super feminine and the super masculine aspects of this, um, this character. Yeah because she is so fierce but it did not go unnoticed that she is wearing heels this whole film. That was not my idea. (laughs) Well, my hat is off to you. And I actually wanted to discuss that stunt work because you guys are both such worthy adversaries. And it occurred to me as I watched that scene on the lake, you were actually movie drowning her, (laughs) which is like, that's no small feat. And so can you describe that specifically? Like, what was that like? And when when or if a stunt person took over? Well, I mean, I think... We were really lucky with our stunt team because they were so inclusive and we'd basically go in with them, you know, kind of every day or whenever we could and just train with them the way that they were training. And so they were really kind of specifically showing us how to do things. And then it gets to a certain point where you sort of look at each other and you trust each other and you know each other's bodies well enough that you can be like, okay, I'm going to push further on this one. Obviously, you know, I'm not no one's looking to hurt anybody, but we definitely went as hard as we possibly could, I'd say. Yeah, and we were lucky because, I don't know, maybe you, maybe you planned this, but we <laughs> didn't shoot that until the very end. Yeah. Oh, uh-huh. they became adversaries, you know. That was, that was all the plan, you know, all along. Ah, so it's like a whole, a whole shoot and the build-up and everybody's tired. Yeah, and you irritated with each other. There you go, it wasn't acting. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> Was but to be fair, they, the, the, most of the uh, the fight. I mean, credit to the to the stunt team. But um, uh, Kate and Anya did, are in those um, fight scenes quite a lot. You'd be surprised, you know. I was very worried for both of you. We were worried for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we like we worked really really hard to be able to do it because, as Kate said, it was really important for the characters to to have that physicality. But I also I really do think it comes from a place of trust. You don't trust the person that you're throwing really strong punches at, or if you're receiving them, you're not really going to get a good scene because you're going to be unsafe. And so out of trust, you can kind of sort of torture each other a little bit more, if that makes sense. It it does to me. What does it say about me? So um, Ridley, I wanted to ask you, because a lot of your films have dealt with AI, versus humanity 
or with humanity. Would you say that over time, your attitude towards that has changed in a significant way? Do you have any different ideas or beliefs now as compared to a long time ago? Um, I think it's even more feasible and more inevitable now. I think if we let them do it, they'd definitely have a go. Um, whoever they, they are, it's probably certainly not going to happen in this country with the control. But in other countries, I think, I, I would imagine it's already has begun. It's already happening. Chilling words to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, and because this is something that's already happening, while you two were crafting your characters, was there ever anything that you, that you tried that seemed like too much or too little? We've already talked about how you wanted to be more of a badass, Kate. Was there anything else that significantly changed in your process? Well, you do have to sort of eliminate any sort of emotional... Um, a, a lot of emotions uh, that you would naturally have as a human being. So that I think that was the most challenging thing um, for me, playing this character, because, you know, you're not supposed... We're, we're very, very trained, and we're supposed to have sort of... Um, you know, very specific boundaries in our minds and, and not a lot of emotional aspects to our... How does one go about turning that off? It, it seems like a very difficult thing to make it like a faucet. So if you're in the mode of the role and you're being very unemotional, how does that work out when they call cut? I'm just... <laughs> I can be emotionless really easily, right, Luke? <laughs> Ice cold all the way. <laughs> so totally focused, but that was, yeah, that's how you came across all the time, though, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just, I guess that's just your job as an actor. Um, yeah, weird. Yeah. Acting. Yeah. I always forget that that's <laughs> happening. Actually, it was quite, it was quite interesting because trying to find the appropriate reactions, I suppose, to certain mm. things that, you know, you, you weren't overdoing anything, really. That was kind of cool, actually. You were very focused in that respect. Anya, what about you? Like, were was there like a big shift in how you wanted to portray Morgan? I mean, I think it was really, really useful because I went out to Ireland about two weeks or something like that um, prior to anything, and so Luke and I would kind of sit down every day and you know have all of these different ideas. And Morgan went through a lot of different incarnations during that time period, and then we found this clip of this girl who had been you know locked in a room yeah. remember that and that was the day that we both just went ah, that was that's something it. jennifer like, jason lee sent us didn't yeah that yeah. was really hardcore and it was just something in her facial expression that i just as soon as i saw it i was like that's morgan I, that's if i can do that then that is morgan and then it's interesting because lee's you know very closed and, and quite, you know, contained, whilst Morgan, I think, has so many feelings. She's experiencing everything for the first time. So it's almost kind of like ping pong balls. You're going from one emotion to this emotion to that emotion. And just, you know, when you're that strong and you're that, you know, capable, I guess, in so many different ways, it makes you a little bit, uh, a little bit dangerous, I guess. <laughs> and kind of cuckoo bananas is the word that came to my mind as well. No. But you know what was... I love her. <laughs> yeah. But Anya really accessed this kind of level of vulnerability with a level of danger and kind of balanced that stuff all the time, which must have been really difficult, actually, to maintain a consistency there. You know, and, and I mean, all credit to you, because I only discovered this in hindsight. Though we did talk about all of those ping-pong emotions going around anyway. You know, that um, you did find that vulnerability and that um, danger as well. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, um, I thought it was, yeah. Well, what it, what it is is more of, um, I guess, just as I am as an actor, I, my characters are really real for me. And so if it's, it's almost kind of asking, like, what the character wants, you know what I mean? And if something feels wrong, I know it's because I'm not thinking the right thoughts. I'm not thinking her thoughts the right way. And so... And I know we keep talking about the stunt teams, but like that did change everything because it just changes the way that you kind of react to whatever feeling you have inside. And that was invaluable. And yeah, no, I really, I know you guys have just seen it. So you probably think she's a bit of a psycho, but I, I really love her. I, I, have, I have like, I feel for her. I think that's what, and that's what makes a, a, a performance really come across and land with people is what, you know, you're supposed to. So it's, yeah. it's good that you feel that way. Um, Ridley, I wanted to ask you, what trait 
does Morgan have that you wish that you possessed? Are there any? Um, uh, a, uh, over the years, I think uh, you learn to not compromise. I think when you begin, you tend to compromise for all kinds of reasons, usually based out of insecurity, because you're, you're on a new treadmill, you're on a new game, and uh, because also you don't quite know, really know what you're doing, so in my case, I learned as I was going, there was no formal training, I just I would make mistakes, and, and gradually it's learning to be not compromising. I don't compromise that much, but I try, I try to be fun, don't I? Yeah. You're fun, um, yeah. But, uh, you know, the thing is, when you get really experienced, um, it can either spell out that there is going to be a dullness attached to it, or when you get really, really experienced, it means you know what the fuck you're doing. And so I tend to walk on the floor knowing exactly what I'm going to do. And, that, and, and off that, but I still leave it open to, you know, the, the thespians, that's actors, okay, <laughs> who actually... I will want to say this way or that way, and I'll always leave that open, right? Yeah. I say, what do you want to do? So, and frequently, uh, it's l the key, if you're going to do my job, or if you're going to be an actor, you, to know what the hell you're doing when you walk on that floor. You need to know what you're going to do. You need to have a really good target. Can you and Luke both talk about how you came across the script and how you decided to put it into production as a producer and director? I think you know that best. I was just told he has this thing he really I, likes that went off. Oh, great, okay, good. Nice. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, it's a, it's a it was, uh, hmm. Well, it was a, a happy accident actually because I wrote a short film called Loom, which was a, a kind of a similar type of Frankenstein story um, that was a short film that it was for Red Camera. Um, and Fox asked me to expand upon it, which I did, and wrote a script that had nothing to do with Loom. Um, but in, in, in that period, a, another script from Seth Owen came to my attention, and uh, I read it. And there was one scene which uh, really struck me, and, and actually why I got interested in it was the scene between what you've just seen, uh, between Anya and Paul Giamatti, the interview. Right. And that, it originally ran, at, I think, like 20-odd 20, 20 pages, so it was quite a, an intense scene. And I thought, Jesus, that would be great to do, have a shot at that. And, um, and I think it's, uh, it's a great scene. It really is. I, I, in watching it the second time, the thing that struck me is at first I thought, oh, gosh, how awful for Morgan to be in the room with you know, this fierce horrible person and then I watched it again and I went oh my god how horrible for him <laughs> you know it's yeah. so it's so interesting there's such a great turn in that scene that is really haunting yeah I mean she really starts to mess with him and, oh um, yeah and you know while we're on that topic can we just talk about taking a chunk out of his neck it was fun it was how <laughs> dope is that <laughs> oh my goodness so like the actual spitting wasn't that much fun because I had to have it in my mouth for a while and I was what like, was it like prosthetic neck <laughs> thing, um, but you know we shot that scene over two days, and it was, you know, by the end of each day, we we couldn't really talk anymore. We were just a bit like, oh, well, it was okay, like because it's yeah. so intense, and you're doing it again and again and again, and you know it's Paul Giamatti, and so you're like, oh my god. Um, but it was when we finally got to the bit where I I, I got to eat him a little bit. Um, it was. <laughs> It kind of felt like we, we did a good job, yeah. and it was fun because it wasn't scripted that I was supposed to spit it back at him, but I'm, I'm glad Morgan did. Tension release. Because Morgan, Morgan was angry. You know they did that scene as one take. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for that's, two days. That's brutal for two days. and we yeah, kept Just over and in. over? It I was know. like acting school. It was amazing. You know, you're sitting across the table from, and this was my second movie, I'd just come off The Witch, and um, you're sitting across the table from Paul Giamatti, and he's screaming at you and he's you know doing all of these unexpected things which i i didn't go to drama school i didn't know that if you fluffed a line you could just take it back and do it again and you didn't have to cut and i was like oh okay noted <laughs> um but uh yeah no it was it was a real gift and we all went out for dinner the the day that we had finished that and we're just like 
11 pages of script, man. Good job. <laughs> wow. And what a, and there's, that has, uh, this film has such a great set, you know, and I was really struck by him demanding to be let behind the glass. And I, I thought that, you know, I wanted to ask you to talk about just being on that set. And you were largely, you know, Kate, you also experienced this being inside the enclosure. And I feel like it is. It's like an enclosure. It's like a zoo, a human zoo almost. It, were, it was mostly Anya, though, because for the first few days, she and I really only interacted between the glass. And we, we had rehearsed enough with our stunts and, and with Luke as well that we had this... Well, we had most of our stunts down like a dance and so yeah. because you you can't really hear each other very well through the glass you know we, we didn't communicate that much verbally but we would every once in a while just do our physical yeah. movements together just to sort of say hello yeah like this weird um ritual every day completely and i mean the it was so strange because we, you know, we had shot so much of the behind the glass. I, I call it the cage. It's yeah. not bloody enclosure, it's a cage. Um, but like, it was crazy because we went out and we shot some of the stuff in the woods. And then we realized that we had to reshoot some stuff. And going back in there was really quite horrible. I was like, oh no, I don't, because it, it, it's kind of soundproof in there. And so a lot of the time that, you know, if people were on my side of the glass, it was fine and I could interact with everyone and it was awesome. But if it was on the other side of the glass, I was just sort of in a room watching everyone, but not really being able to hear them and just sort of sitting there and being like, oh, okay, I really Hold understand how she feels. Helps you kind of go method, so to speak, with yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, being it, so it, isolated. more than method, I'd say empathy. I just mm -hmm. felt, I really felt for her so much um, throughout all of that. And I guess that in a way, allows you to kind of justify the, you know, things that might make other people think that she's not that great. <laughs> Do you think she, she says at one point, I feel terribly about it. Do you think she really felt terribly? Are you asking? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you guys think she really feels? Because, I mean, I you were talking she, about that a minute ago, she thought she did. But. Yeah, I, I think that she does. But, you know, it's what you said before of, like, She's, she's my character, of course I love her, and you know, of course I think she feels. I think it's more than feeling terrible in terms of like, oh, you know, this really hurts. I think she's upset she's made a mistake that she didn't know was a mistake. She's learning everything, and so she's like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't know that that was, that that was bad. I apologize sorry, for Paul that. Sorry, Paul Giamatti's neck. I didn't know that was bad. <laughs> oh no, that one she meant, and that one she okay, did not good, feel yeah. horrible about True. at all. <laughs> I think there was genuine remorse, you know. Um, the thing about Morgan the, as a character is it's a real tragedy because, in my mind, she's a great success as a human. Completely. And that's what we got at the end on the... You, you, it's very subtle, but we talked about it, was that Morgan, the tears are not because... Well, she's arrived. She realizes because she's feeling stuff, I'm human. And that's a terrible tragedy, and, and of course it's all over. <laughs> and to that, just that line about the, the cruelest thing you can do is press their mm. face to the glass, I was like, oh, she is right about that. Yeah, oh, I just mentioned one thing about that set, is that it was very oppressive. But um, we designed it, it has a footprint. Um, we were sitting there doing this thing, and it actually has a footprint of a, of a human womb is that we looked at biological books and we started to fiddle about with that kind of thing and um, it actually, the footprint of it, the kind of actual bird's eye design of it is, uh, is like a womb. Now you know, guys. Uh, we're opening this up to our hashtag Ask Alamo questions and uh, in honor of the phenomenal internet, I wanted to start with this David Carzell tweet. Hey, Kate Mara, how long have you known that you're a... F Can I swear, guys? Just yell yeah, at me, yes yeah, or no? Yeah, just do it. All right, good. Be brave. <laughs> hey, Kate Mara, how long have you known you're a fucking savage? <laughs> yes. And I def there's you're a lot of love straight. in that tweet. There's a lot of love. Um, how how do I respond to that? Uh, really thank you. Yeah. What was his name? David. Yeah, just thanks. Thanks, David. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, Frank Lannister would, he said, uh, just saw 
Morgan and loved it. Great mix of gorgeous wide shots and quick action takes. Any advice for aspiring filmmakers? Let's direct that to Ridley and Luke. You did it, dude. You answer. Um, do your homework. Um, study hard. You know. I mean, do your homework and uh, you know, know what you're doing, and let the let the actors act. That's hard, I'd imagine. Yeah. It's challenging to have some restraint at times. No, the thing you've got to do is just do it. You have to do it. You can pontificate. There's no, people say it's harder to get a film going today than ever before. It's bullshit. You've got so many video devices that you can go out this weekend with your friends and somebody clubs together by the hamburgers, make a goddamn movie and stop whining about it. <laughs> You owe him a check for uh, tuition, which is equal to that of college for that answer. You got. Thanks, quick guys. Class. Uh, Dame Nicole would like to know, she says, I work in AI, and I'm curious the research that you did for this and why you chose a female bot. Um, we did research. Um, I went to the U uh, University of Belfast, Queen's University, uh, to the um, biogenetics lab, and had a long conversation with a, with a professor who I think wishes to remain nameless. Uh, he was very uncomfortable with the conversation that we had about the efficacy and possibility of uh, this kind of technology. But we, I really looked into the, the, you may have heard about it now, but the CRISPR um, genetic splicing techniques that are now available. Um, uh, and I think somebody won a Nobel Peace Prize, the two scientists, female scientists, who, 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 put, who uh, discovered this technique. Um, uh, why uh, Morgan, okay, I sat there and thought long and hard about what Morgan's appearance would be like. Um, and I realized it, if I was a scientist putting together this kind of creature, I certainly wouldn't make a monster. I'd make something that's very familiar. Um, uh, to me and the world, um, not, not to horrify. Of course, Morgan represents a kind of evolutionary step. Um, there is a, I think that there was a, a, a decision to make Morgan androgynous simply because uh, it, was a, it was a way of checking that the creature wouldn't reproduce. We saw how well that worked in other films, such as Jurassic Park. <laughs> uh, Canopy is asking, and I'll direct this to you, Anya, is Morgan driven most to survive, love, or kick ass? <laughs> Ooh. Um, a little bit of both. Uh, no, I think it's, um, when we were first having our conversations, you know, Luke and I, during rehearsals, we were always talking about, you know, Morgan's kind of like, a wild animal in a way. And if you back a wild animal up into a cage, like into the corner of a cage and you're not gonna let it get out, it's gonna get out fighting. Does that mean that it wants to fight? Probably not. It, I, don't think she's, I don't think she's got like rage within her that she just wants to kind of like go out and fuck up everything. I think she's just more, she wants to get out of there. So I guess survival, yeah, she, she's, driven to survive, but I think she's driven to survive because she wants to experience things like love, and she wants to experience and, and be human and feel, but in order to do that, you gotta be alive, so. Man, because when she's standing on the lake and saying like, is this heaven? Yeah. It's like, oh man, I wish we could even answer that, Morgan. You know, that was a moment. The dish master would like to know. Ooh. I love Twitter. If, <laughs> if you could create your own superhuman, what qualities would it possess? You snapped your head up really fast over there, Ridley. I know you have an answer waiting on hand. Oh, um, I haven't actually. <laughs> um, what qualities would it possess? I think we're so far down the line and in uh, speculation, far more than I think is published or discussed. And I think... Um, you know, it's a little bit like saying, when you get the very smartest computer you can possibly design, the first thing you're gonna do is, is get that computer to design 
a, another computer which is smarter than they are. Mm -hmm. Then you get these two computers to commune. Once you do that, you're in real trouble because they're so far ahead of you, yeah. then they've already disconnected this and connected that, and they're, they're thinking miles ahead of you. Yeah. So once we do that, we're in real trouble. So I think you've always got to keep a handle on what you're doing. So that, and that's, and that's kind of what it would possess, is just the ability to surpass you ever so quickly, exponentially. I think they've done it already. I think there's two, there's supercomputers around. Oh God, Ridley, you're yeah. killing me over here. Definitely. <laughs> they're gonna take us over on the skirting board. They connect everything with the, the every wire in the, Every building, there's a connection. Do people ever, in the, in the scientific world, do they ever just randomly kind of contact you and want to share these kinds of developments with you because of your artistic work? Uh, no, I think, no, actually, no, there's a real connection with, I uh, had a very good experience with NASA and with um, um, JPL, Jet Propulsion mm -hmm. Laboratory. The Jet, JPL have long hair elastic bands and flip-flops because mm -hmm. uh, they make engines and machines. And NASA have suits and ties because they make engines and machines that send human beings up there. But they work together. And uh, they, I got put to know them pretty well. And they would say, um, what are your spacesuits going to look like? I said, I'm going to not show you mine until you show me yours. <laughs> and then they showed me their spacesuit. And I said, that's absolutely fucking terrible. They said, we know. Can we borrow yours? So. <laughs> They fundamentally regard their evolution, because it's like astrophysics, super mathematics. It's an art form. Science is art. People don't, people think science is science. Science is more than that, science is art, right? Mathematics are art. And it's, so it's a bit like being a brilliant screenwriter. You're screwing around with abstracts till you form order. That's mathematics, right? no difference. Let's go back to that superhuman question. If you I guys. I avoided it. Oh. <laughs> you did expertly, sir, and I look to Anya sitting next to you. If you guys had a, created a superhuman, what, what is the trait that you really want it to possess? I don't know. I think. You I wouldn't guys really don't want to play God one. over there? No, don't want to play All God, right. man. So you've learned your lesson from basically every movie from ever. From three done. months in Ireland. We, we, <laughs> yeah, we, we figured it out. When, when you guys were filming, is the, were the circumstances of filming such that you guys were isolated as a cast from everyone else in the area in Ireland? Like, did you guys have kind of a place away from everyone, or did you just leave the set and go into a normal metropolis? Well, I... I mean, I guess I was on set most of the time, as was Luke anyway, so by the time we would wrap at night, I, I was very, I kept myself very isolated. I, it mm -hmm. kind of helped me in a lot of ways. Um, but I think the rest of the cast would go out most nights, right, Anya? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, no, I, there was an incredible Irish crew, and they're such lovely people, and Belfast is a really, really interesting place to film, and so I just spent a lot of time with the crew just kind of discovering new parts of Belfast and stuff like that. And also, I mean, the other actors were living in a hotel and Kate and I had kind of our own separate apartments. And so I'd just get people around to my apartment because other than that, you know, I was on the other side of the glass and it was pretty lonely. So I needed, I yeah. needed some people human time. contact. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, Kate, this question comes from Filmmaker. How many times did you throw that chair against the glass, and was that damage real? Yeah, I was really trying to damage it. It didn't. It didn't want to break that glass. Um, you were hurling that chair. We did it a bunch you of. You did it a times? lot of times because mm. I think I said break the glass. Yeah, I was trying really, really. But really I knew hard. that it wasn't going to break. <laughs> it was an evil, evil trick. It was fun though. I, I I enjoyed that. Yeah, that was one of my favorite scenes. <laughs> I feel like that's going to be like a new LA fitness craze. <laughs> You know, break the glass. It is a good workout, yeah. right? Like pick up a chair and just throw it at this. Well, you, you know, the, the hardest part about it was was having to remember that it will bounce back in your face. So <laughs> there's a learning yeah. curve to it. Yeah, got it. Uh, <laughs> in Ma heels. As well. Oh, in heels didn't ex didn't go unnoticed. Uh, Mao Makita wants to know: uh, Could this potentially be the first peek into a broader world, Luke? Uh, maybe see more of Lee and the corporation. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. Oh, all right. 
And I'm just going to give you a knowing smile. <laughs> Weirdo Alan A. Wool, <laughs> Twitter. Uh, how is our definition of humanity challenged differently by humanoid robots versus bioengineered superhumans? There are so many, t many syllables in that question. I'm impressed. Humanoid robots versus bioengineered superhumans. How is our definition of humanity challenged by that? A lot of syllables, guys. I'm having trouble wrapping my brain around it. I think um, bioengineered humans is far more likely than robotics. Um, I think that the, they, they, they offer a greatest challenge uh, to humanity, simply because it's like, you know, once the germ gets in, 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 the, um, in the species, it's goodbye humans part one. And hello, humans, part two. You know, between uh, you and Ridley down there, this is really uplifting. <laughs> We're all going to die. You're welcome. <laughs> Does anybody keep anything from the sets that you're on? That's for all of you. Oh, I kept it, not from this movie, but... Um, uh, Oh, that's not true. I did. I did keep a pair of heels. Thank you for that, Luke. Um, I, I, I kept one of my spacesuits from The Martian, Brid. Wow. Yeah. We noticed. <laughs> <laughs> it will be deducted. We did have some reshoots, and I got a call from the, the, the costume designer saying, I'm not joking. We need you to bring your spacesuit for the reshoots. And I had a slight panic on that one, but I found it. So, yeah. <laughs> and just a post-it sitting somewhere, bring space suit. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. What about you? Do you keep anything, Anya? Yeah. I mean, I keep, um, whenever I, I like jewelry a lot, my jewelry is kind of like my armor, but whenever I go in to do a job, I take it all off and whatever's, you know, a lot of my characters actually usually have one outfit. And so, you know, from Thomason, I kept her garters and her, you know, ribbons from Morgan. I kept the hoodie that I wore nice. every day. Still have it at home, still wear it. It looked itchy. Pretty comfy. That's weird. <laughs> no, I get, like, it's just like a jumper. It's just like a really comfy jumper. Um, and yeah, I kind of, I love doing that. It's, um, it's a way of keeping a part of them, I guess, and reminding you of like, you know, what you've done. Ridley, do you keep anything from movies? Uh, not initially, never. Um, except now I, I, I kept a very teeny space suit because one a quick anecdote. I was standing in the set in H stage and I was looking up at 45 feet to the gantry, which is not that high. And I'd built a landing leg and I was looking at this landing leg thinking it doesn't look, it's never big enough, so it's not big enough. And there's an elevator on it which three spacemen would come down on it. And the three men, or Sigourney was six foot and two guys, it didn't look big at all. So I had four days to go, so I had a quick, small spacesuit made for three midgets, two of them as kids, and another child of a cameraman, and I stuck them up, uh, and the leg was suddenly 60 feet. So I learned about miniatures. I had to wire my kids to it in case they fell off them. So I said, behave, they were up there like 50 feet up. <laughs> so I kept the suit, I still got that suit. It would be magic. <laughs> Got anything to top that, brother? Just my memories, really. Oh, my guys. sweet memories of. <laughs> no, I don't. I um, storyboards. I got Rose. Still, it's not a tiny space. Sorry, that's. <laughs> I'm sure they're beautiful, though. It's a beautiful film. Yeah. <laughs> As we've heard. That's actually all the time that we have, guys. I've been given the official wrap. Uh, so I want to say goodbye again, of course, to Facebook, to all of our Alamo theaters watching, to you at The Egyptian. And make sure when this movie comes out, you're tweeting about it. Opening weekend is important. Ridley Scott, Anya Taylor-Joy, Kate Mara, and director Luke Scott. <laughs>